This is Chapter 1, Part 2. We are now moving into a discussion of theory and specifically the three primary theoretical frameworks. Um, part 1 of Chapter 1, of course, was focused on the sociological perspective, sociological imagination, and then Parts 3 and 4 are going to be providing a detailed uh, overview of research methodology. But this part is going to discuss theory. So what is a theory? Um, this is probably a concept that you have heard or learned before in your science classes. Um, there are many commonly known theories um, that uh, people are often aware of outside of sociology from the Big Bang Theory to evolutionary theory um, to you know uh, Newton's theory of uh, gravity. Um, but all a theory really is, is just a general statement about how some parts of the world fit together and how they work. Um, so it's kind of a speculative uh, statement about how you uh, imagine the world works. And so for sociological theory, um, you want to think about this as being these kind of logical frameworks for the interpretation of social life um, that make particular assumptions and ask particular questions about the social world. So when you choose a theoretical framework, you go into your uh, you know, your interpretation, um, just kind of making certain assumptions about what your focus is going to be, um, as well as kind of what you are looking for uh, in a specific social phenomena. And so before we even get into the three primary frameworks, I want to introduce two terms, macro sociological and micro sociological. So one way in which you can decide about decide on which framework you want to use is to think about what type of lens um, you would need. So if you think about theoretical frameworks as being a pair of glasses, then macro sociological frameworks are when you want to see the big picture. You know, when you want to see, when you're looking far away, when you're looking at society as a whole, macro means broad matters. And so this type of framework is interested in large scale patterns and institutions where society itself is kind of the primary focus or actor. And for our three primary uh, frameworks, we have two macro sociological frameworks to choose from and they're kind of opposite of one another. We have structural functionalists and we have the conflict uh, theoretical framework. Micro sociological is when you're looking at um, smaller, more individualistic matters, um, individual situations, uh, small groups, um, social relations, and interactions. Um, and so here you, you know, you see the guy squinting at the small piece of paper. Um, so, you know, this is a much more narrow focus. Um, and this is the only, um, symbolic interactionism is our only micro sociological framework that we'll discuss um, in, in detail detail really uh, in this class. And so these three primary primary theoretical frameworks uh, are covered by a kind of uh, cartoon overview uh, that I provided you a video for in the module. Um, this is the link um, if you haven't watched the video. Um, the video actually covers four uh, frameworks, but as I wrote in the video caption, I am not requiring, I'm not going over social constructionism, so you can kind of skip over that one. Um, we will only be focusing on structural functionalism, conflict, and symbolic interactionism. Um, and, you know, as you can kind of see uh, in the chart, you know, two of those are macro uh, focus and one is a micro focus. Um, and they also uh, kind of differ in whether or not they believe society should enact social change or not. And so we will take each theoretical framework uh, one by one um, and go over a little bit more details as well as introduce the kind of primary theorist associated with that framework. So beginning with the structural functionalist paradigm or framework, um, this 
framework explains social organizations and change in terms of their functions. Um, and the emphasis is on social solidarity and stability. The idea that society is largely stable because everything in society has a function um, and that those functions are interrelated um, and by working together uh, we have this kind of social stability, um, which structural functionalists really highlight as being a positive good thing. The question that structural functionalists uh, ask oftentimes is what is the function of blank? Because the assumption is, is that if it exists and persists in society, it must serve a function. Sometimes those functions are manifest, which is uh, quite apparent and stated um, and the kind of general accepted um, uh, function and sometimes those functions can be latent where they are not as clear not as stated um, but that doesn't mean that it isn't still serving that function this just may not be the function that is uh, being talked about so you know a good example would be something like education you know the stated function of education of course is to have more knowledgeable informed citizens um, and uh, you know to transmit skills um, to help people um, learn how to live uh, in our society in, in our society all of those are manifest uh, functions latent functions of the educational system is that it keeps people um, out of the job market um, until they reach kind of the decided upon age of adulthood you know um, by requiring children to go to school up to a certain age um, it eliminates uh, adolescents and teenagers from being uh, you know full time workers and uh, being potential competition for adult workers um, in the labor market. Another latent function of education is the assumption that it is in the educational arena that people will uh, find uh, their uh, partners and life mates. Um, you know, our society is organized around the concept of families built upon monogamous partnerships um, and schools, whether high school and, and now maybe even more so college. Um, you know, school is the primary kind of meeting place for young people because you spend uh, the bulk of your time around your peers. Um, and that won't necessarily be true uh, once you're out of the schooling arena. Um, although this isn't something that we say about schools, which is why this is a latent function. Um, the structural functionalist paradigms does also consider the fact that sometimes um, things aren't functional um, and in fact are dysfunctional um, and so they write about something uh, about things being dysfunctional in society and kind of the consequences of having things in society um, like for instance you know racial or gender discrimination which from just a kind of a objective viewpoint are actually dysfunctional uh, to societal stability um, and solidarity. What a major weakness of this paradigm is, is uh, the fact that it just fails to consider inequality. It kind of talks about individuals and actors within society as if, as if they have equal amounts of power and status. Um, and we know this to not be true. The leading functionalist Durkheim uh, theorist is Emil Durkheim. Um, and then later Robert Morton, uh, Merton, but Emil Durkheim in particular is kind of the early sociologist that you want to associate with this framework. He was especially interested in uh, social solidarity um, and stability and you will see his name in multiple chapters um, uh, coming up. So as we go through um, this presentation, you know, uh, just kind of as a thought exercise, because this is something that I do with my in-person students, uh, you know, consider how you would use the functionalist lens to theorize about divorce. Like, how would you explain divorce by using the functionalist lens? Keeping in mind that uh, for most of the early part of American history, divorce was extremely rare um, and particularly hard for women. 
um, to access um, that we saw a small rise in divorce um, in 1920 uh, during and and then it declined uh, kind of during the time of the Great Depression um, and then we saw uh, our next spike after World War II um, as people perhaps found themselves married to people that they did not really know very well um, people got married during the war very quickly and at much younger ages especially uh, women and well actually women and men at much younger ages than they had in in decades uh, previous Um, and of course we did not really know about PTSD so we certainly know that a lot of men came back from the war um, with uh, mental health um, issues uh, that their families their wives were not necessarily equipped to deal with Um, but then uh, in the years after um, we then saw those divorce rates uh, steadily decline um, until finally around 19 70 when California passed the first no-fault divorce law meaning you could get divorced without proving it was anyone's fault instead you could just cite you know irreconcilable differences we saw a kind of steady increase in divorce um, for like the next 10 years and then it it declined after reaching its kind of height in the 80s but it never quite went back to those um, you know early uh, early rates so what I'm asking you here is if you were going to put on the functionalist glasses, you know, what would you say uh, to explain this phenomena? What would be your interpretation using the functionalist lens? And so just take a few minutes to think about it, maybe jot down some ideas. Um, I'll come back to this question once we've gone through all three perspectives. Coming now to the second macrosociological perspective, which is the social conflict lens. And this lens is easy to remember um, because it the functionalists and the conflict frameworks are basically opposites of one another. If the structural functionalist lens emphasizes social stability, um, unsurprisingly, because it's right there in the name, the conflict paradigm emphasizes the role of conflict. So it explains social organization and change in terms of conflict that's built into the social relationships um, that exist in society. Uh, Conflict theorists see society as an arena of inequality, um, and because of this, uh, there is kind of continuous conflict and change and the big question that the conflict paradigm asks is you know who benefits and who loses um, so whether you're talking about the media whether you're talking about education whether you're talking about relationships there is this focus on you know who finds these types of arrangements social arrangements beneficial and who loses in um, these types of social arrangements um, and the kind of underlying assumption here is that each group in society, whether you're talking about class, race, gender, they act in its own interests. Um, However, um, because society is set up in such a way that people don't have equal amounts of power, one group often has more power. Um, So if you're thinking about something like class, you know, the upper class has more power than the working class or the poor. Um, If you're thinking about something like gender, you know, historically speaking, um, you know, men have had more power um, than women and still have more power than women because of these historical arrangements. Um, so the weakness of this this paradigm is because if you took it at face value, you would assume that society is kind of always in this kind of tense, uh, you know, conflict written state. Um, but, you know, oh, we can kind of look at contemporary society and certainly we can look at past um, historical periods and see that that's not always been true, that there are these periods of consensus in society and that oftentimes uh, groups, despite having differing amounts of power, um, they in fact uh, still kind of experience a lot of stability in their their power relations. Um, 
meaning that they are not constantly, you know, at odds with one another despite these differences and in, in power despite the this this inequality, um, which kind of goes against what the conflict paradigm assumes. The leading conflict theorist, early conflict theorist, is Karl Marx, um, who we will talk about in greater detail when we get to our stratification section um, of this uh, of this semester. Um, it's enough to say that you know we often associate him with communism um, and he was very interested in the class relations uh, that exist between um, the people that he called uh, the bourgeoisie who or capitalists who owned the means of production and then uh, the people that he called the proletariat or the workers um, and he was very very uh, kind of interested in uh, the cap class conflict that exists between those two groups and he speculated about what the future would hold um, in regards to that now there are sub perspectives in conflict theory where once again the focus is still on conflict but uh, for instance, feminism shifts from the focus from being on social class to specifically on gender and power. Um, and critical race theory shifts the focus from being on social class to specifically um, conflict between racial groups. And an emerging form of uh, academic scholarship is on disability um, and kind of the conflict um, that uh, exists in uh groups that we call like able-bodied and groups uh, that we um, uh, kind of consider as being living with a disability and how social arrangements are set up so that those that who live with a disability often have less power and less access to power. Um, so all of these groups would also still be considered conflict uh, theorists um, just uh, with a very specific sub perspective. So now I want you to once again go back to, um, you know, what uh, you have learned about kind of divorce and the changing divorce rates in America over time. And now I want you to put on your conflict glasses. If you were to use the conflict lens, how would you explain uh, the changing rates in divorce over time um, in America? So once again, just take a second to consider, you know, um, that primary question of the conflict paradigm, who wins and who loses and use that to provide uh, an interpretation of those divorce rates. And now we are at our final theoretical paradigm or framework in our only microsociological theoretical framework, which is symbolic interactionism. Um, so symbolic interactionism is specifically kind of interested in how people understand and interpret themselves and their social interactions. Um, the focus is kind of on uh, language and other symbols um, because language itself is a symbolic system. Um, so symbolic interactionists are kind of you are 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 interested in the symbolic nature of human communication as a means of understanding society as a whole um, and the question that they ask is you know how do we interact how do we create and interpret symbols um, and how does the fact that we can have very differing um, interpretations of symbols how does that contribute to um, our understandings of one another, our understandings of what's going on in society. Um, and so symbolic interactionists start with this assumption that people acquire a sense of who they are through interactions with others um, and that this is kind of the basis of self. Uh, this is going to be the focus of our chapter four. Um, so although I'm going over it pretty quickly as an introduction, uh, you know, we will sp be spending a lot of time on this idea and on this framework uh, in upcoming weeks. Now, a weakness of symbolic interactionism is just that because it's micro level and it's really just focused on how people understand themselves and how they understand other people through their interactions with those people, you know, that focus on the micro level really just kind of obscures and overlooks the role of larger structural context, which is the focus, of course, of both of the macro sociological frameworks. Um, you know, it, it doesn't acknowledge the role that larger societal 
uh, institutions um, and frameworks play and certainly those frameworks uh, can impact uh, interaction uh, but uh, symbolic interactionists don't focus on this. The leading symbolic interactionist is George Herbert Mead. Um, this is a name that we will be spending a lot of time on in chapter four but he was interested in how people develop a sense of self and how they develop that sense of self in the context of their interactions and relationships with other people. And so now for the final time, I want you to put on those micro sociological lenses in the form of symbolic interactionism. And I want you to answer that question. If you were to explain the changing rates of divorce in America using that focus, um, how would you do so? You know, keeping in mind the emphasis on symbols and communications and how people interpret symbols um, and interpret um, communication with other people. All right. And so before we leave theory behind, let's just go to how, um, you know, these three perspectives approach uh, understanding the U.S. divorce rate. Um, and so, you know, symbolic interactionism, because they are interested in small scale patterns and how um, there can be differing definitions and meanings associated with symbols, you know, they might interpret the changing divorce rates through the lens of our, the meanings associated with marriage, the meanings associated with what it means to be a good husband and a good wife have changed over time. People maybe are less likely to think about marriage as being a, a lifelong commitment. Um, people are maybe more likely to focus on both husbands and wives being um, kind of a, a, a partnership, um, a soulmate, someone who completes you. And if you have that meaning, um, that is a much harder, uh, you know, bar to meet than earlier meanings, which really just kind of focused on, you know, is your husband a good provider? Um, you know, does your wife bear you children and take good care of those children? children in the home, easier bars for people to meet. So therefore, easier for people to say, I'm married to a good husband and or wife, um, and we have a good marriage, as that bar has become harder for people to meet, and people are less likely to think about marriage as being a lifelong commitment. Perhaps this explains why people are, uh, have, have become more apt to seeking a divorce than, you know, 50 years ago. Um, functional analysis, which really focuses on, you know, what is the function of, of something, um, you know, they might point to the fact that marriage, social change has kind of, has kind of changed the structure of marriage uh, and family. And there are less families that have this kind of traditional marriage structure where you have a stay at home, um, you know, a wife and mother and a breadwinner husband and father that in that type of marriage, the functions of a husband and wife are very clearly outlined um, and really in order to kind of have a successful family unit it was easier because uh, their their functions were so clearly divided nowadays where you have more and more you know women working outside of the home um, it is not necessarily clear uh, that people have these uh, functions that are kind of um, cooperative with one another. If anything, they can be in conflict with one another, um, which can perhaps lead to family ties weakening um, and people being more likely to divorce. Conflict theorists would emphasize the fact that in earlier societies, men had so much more power than women that uh, divorce wasn't likely because women had no way to really take care of themselves um, and had no real recourse of action uh, to get out of a bad marriage. And that that increase in divorce, especially uh, in the 1970s, um, that sharp spike was because society finally offered women a little bit of equal power. Um, in the form of increasing their opportunities in the education and in the occupational sectors. Um, and women took advantage of that by um, em embracing those opportunities and no longer feeling as if they needed to stay in a bad marriage just in order to have some form of financial stability. Um, and so they would say that these divorce rates are just indicative of people are no longer trapped um, in these marriages of, of unequal equal power.
so as you can see, you know, none of these three perspectives are disputing that the rates exist, right? The rates are as they are, like it's empirical evidence that they are interpreting differently because their interpretation is based upon the theoretical framework that they are embracing. Um, now, this idea of empiricism and, you know, where does this data come from, that's what we will be tackling in parts three and four um, of chapter one, so in the next two videos.